adjacent to the southern end of the Newcastle Expressway. A woman who lives nearby said a moving train had crashed into a stationary train. One of them is a goods train and the other a passenger train. First report said three people were trapped. Ambulancemen first to the accident called for extra police assistance. Police raced to the scene from area headquarters at Hornsby, some 10 kilometres away. As that happened, reports came through that two people were confirmed dead. John Healy and Derek Potts were in the second last carriage, Hello, travelling to Cohen, well. the next railway station up. John, can you tell us uh, what happened? Yeah, we were in the second last carriage and uh, suddenly we felt this terrific um, crash and we were thrown sideways in our seats. And uh, we got off the train, I got off the train, I went forward to have a look and there was a piece of train all over the place. Not one of those killed was the driver of the passenger train. The other was a passenger on the train which ran up the back of the goods train. At the scene, Laurie Brennan, 7 National News. An order was put in with the Melbourne Tram Board three years ago, but the trams only became available at the end of February and were quickly snapped up at a cost of $1,000 each. That's a bargain, considering trams are sold to overseas interests for between eight and $10,000. The vehicles will be painted up and converted to museums and will be a major... Twenty-four years to arrive. It's been a long wait, but today the State Rail Authority had a boost to its flagging prestige with the opening of the new $112 million electrified Sydney to Newcastle line. On a two and a half hour trip, passengers will enjoy the comforts of these new breed of interurban trains. The SRA has ordered 80 of the high capacity double deckers with new interior colour schemes, improved lighting and more efficient air conditioning. Boarding at Central Station for the inaugural journey this afternoon were Premier Rann, Transport Minister Barry Unsworth and State Rail Authority Chief David Hill. The SRA says these new carriages and electrification will cut 20 minutes off the travelling time to Newcastle, with trains running every hour. A crowd of more than 2,000 waited at Newcastle Station to greet the first train, and despite a minor mishap in the tradition of De Groot, which was quickly patched, the new service got a rousing reception. Steve Barnes, Eyewitness News. New South Wales Transport Minister Barry Unsworth confirmed this afternoon that talks are being held to launch it on the Sydney to Melbourne run. That announcement came as he officially opened the long-promised rail link between Sydney and Newcastle. Even when the Newcastle flyer was being hauled by majestic steam, the powers that be talked of completing electrification to Newcastle. And today it finally happened as this eight-car interurban train left Central and headed north. <laughs> Extending electrification from Gosford to Newcastle cost $112 million and took five years to complete. The gosford Wyong section opened two years ago. And from this point, just north of Wyong today, this train began making history. The new all-electric fly will cut 20 minutes off the Sydney-Newcastle trip. And this is what happened when the first electric commuter train reached Newcastle at 2.45 this afternoon. That having been done, the next major transport step is into Capital XPT services to Melbourne. Talks with the Victorian Government have been going on for some time, and the service is now close to being a reality. David Jones, 7 National News. It's taken over 50 years to complete the electrification of the rail service between the two cities. The overall cost is hard to estimate, but $84 million was spent on the final stretch between Wyong and Newcastle. That's more than a million dollars per kilometre. To celebrate the occasion, two trains left Sydney early this afternoon, loaded with more than 1,600 people, including the Premier, Mr Rann, MPs, members of railway historical societies, retired railway employees and workers on the project. Thousands turned out for its arrival, 
but there was no ribbon cutting for this opening. In true railway style, the leading train broke through a banner as it swept into Newcastle station right on time. In his opening speech, Mr Rand said the government had kept its promise to electrify the Newcastle line and would keep others. But in a year or two, you'll be able to get on an electric train in Newcastle and travel to Wollongong. You can go from Wollongong to Lithgow by a safe, speedy electric train. The expressway will be completed between Newcastle, Sydney, Wollongong. In other words, the three great cities of Australia the three greatest cities probably in the world are going to be linked. <laughs> no one's going to argue about that, are they? If you travel the Sydney to Newcastle line and wonder what difference it'll make to you, well, the services will be more frequent, there'll be an extra nine each weekday, and some trains will be able to cut 20 minutes off the journey, reducing it to two hours and 11 minutes. From Newcastle, this is Inga McLeod. ...train in northern England had been told it was going too fast. The train hurtled off the track on a bend in Northumberland. Surprisingly, no one was killed, although dozens were injured. The overnight express was travelling to London from Aberdeen in Scotland. As the train swept round a sharp bend, the engine and seven sleeping cars left the rails. Several carriages careered up an embankment and through gardens, badly damaging two houses. The elderly owner of one was trapped until police rescued him. 38 people were taken to hospital, none seriously injured. Among them is the train's driver. He's being treated for a broken arm, cuts and shock. People living beside the railway line were the first to arrive. Heard a terrific noise and uh, followed by a complete silence, which made us think there was a problem. We rushed to the bottom of the garden and all we could see was a huge cloud of dust. So I went back into the house and phoned the emergency services and then came back down here with my friend and uh, we collected some hammers and started getting across to the carriages and breaking windows and helping people out. As investigators from British Rail begin their inquiries, their first question is, how fast was the train going? Some passengers claim the speed was too high. A crash on the same bend 15 years ago killed six people. John Gatfield, National 9 News. ...have been Northumberland and crashed into two houses. Officials said the carriages suffered colossal damage and some passengers were trapped. But while 38 people were taken to hospital, most were released after being treated for cuts and bruises. British Rail said new rigid carriages had saved passengers, and rescuers were astounded that many of the injuries suffered were so slight. Absolute miracle. You know, one can say that it's a disaster to have a, a rail crash, but really and truly to have one of this type and uh, the sort of devastation of the track and everything else and people really and truly minor injuries of 38 out of about 100 and odd people it's remarkable yeah. Yeah. lady locks out on everybody's shoulder once the accident happened no yeah. doubt at all an inquiry has started into whether the express was breaking an 80 kilometer speed limit when it came off the curve on the same stretch of track 15 years ago a similar crash killed six people and injured 100 Graham Dobell, ABC News, London. ...west of Sydney. And today, old 3642 was chosen for Harold Fowler's farewell. Just about everyone turned up. Family, friends, workmates. 400 of them. And Harold was in his familiar spot. Has it been work for you or is it fun? Fun. Fun. And I've earned a living from it. So I've enjoyed every moment of it. See you later, Harold. Call a bit, I'll see you along the track. Then it was off for a run to Gosford. the end of the line for Harold Fowler. He's a director of the Zigzag Railway at Lithgow, and he'll be found there most weekends, tending his beloved steam engines. Bob Swift in Sydney. Their return during the Great Train Festival in October, which has been described as the biggest event ever staged in Sydney South. The steam locomotive, some say, is the romantic soul of rail transport. 
Puffing Billy serves Sydney train commuters from when the Illawarra line was opened in 1884 till they were taken off the tracks in 1969. In October, the St George Great Train Festival will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the line's opening and the roar of the steam engines will again be heard. Retired train driver Jack Sparks remembers the old days of steam well. For him, nothing will ever replace the thrill of driving the steam locomotive. You get the right away from the guard and your fireman say, well, I'm right, are you right? Blow the whistle and take off and to open up the throttle and to feel the surge of power that came up underneath a 200-ton locomotive. It's, uh, it's an immense feeling. During the festival, the steam trains will be thundering down the Illawarra line, bringing back the magic of an era long past. Germany have been the guinea pigs in a unique urban transport experiment. Esslingen is being used by the Daimler-Benz company as a proving ground for a variety of new buses using different methods of propulsion. These include buses with both diesel and electric motors, battery-driven buses which can also take power from overhead wires, and guided buses which run in between their own concrete tracks. This test vehicle carries eight passengers and floats above the track at a height of 10 millimetres. But in test runs, its performance was disappointing. Like all new inventions, it had its problems. It reached only 100 kilometres an hour. The train weighed more than two tonnes, and most of that was the weight of the motor. Not only that, it used enough electricity to light a small town and wouldn't go around corners. This is the revolutionary TR6 magnetic levitation train. It's been developed by Transrapid International, a consortium of some of West Germany's largest and most powerful industrial companies. This is the fastest train in the world. The French call it Le Transport Grand Vitesse. Earlier this year, this train set up a new world rail speed record of 380 kilometers an hour. Next month, it will be introduced on the route between Paris and Lyon, cutting the travelling time from four hours to two. Ultimately, the French will have 87 high-speed trains in service, firstly on domestic and later on international services. This level railway crossing at Penrose with an overhead bridge. However, the move has come under uh, criticism from some Penrose residents. Although there have been no major accidents on the Penrose level crossing, residents believe it's only a matter of time. With the XPT train, the locals say at best there's only 25 seconds from the time it comes into sight to when it reaches the crossing. They say especially with big trucks, the likelihood of getting to the other side in time is very small. Yes, you'd have about 25 seconds before the train's at the crossing. Well now with a 40 foot trailer with about 30 ton on, haven't got much of a chance. Some of the locals say now that after the overhead bridge has got the go-ahead, they would prefer the level crossing simply be improved by installing flashing lights. The bridge would be very nice, but then you've got to think of the people on foot. They've got to come across the line. We've got uh, quite a few houses on that side, quite a few people live on that side, and they've got to come across their mail and their groceries and, you know, what not. We've got two shops here on this side. And uh, kiddies going to school, and it's a lot to ask them to uh, to walk 500 yards up the road to cross a bridge, isn't it? To cross the line, where they can, they they just wouldn't do it. Windsor Caribbean Council has wholeheartedly supported the original call by the residents for the overhead bridge. The bridge will cost about $400,000 and the council will pay one third of the cost with the State Rail Authority making up the remainder. The council believes the bridge would be much safer than lights on the level crossing. Well, I believe uh, myself and I think as far as council is concerned that a bridge is far safer than a level crossing. With the XPT going through there now, the, uh, the speed to get across the level crossing is lessened uh, because of the speed of the train and uh, we foresee that we could have accidents there so we believe a bridge would be much better to get the traffic off the railway line. 
passenger train rammed into the rear of a freight train pulling tankers of fuel oil. Geoffrey Sims reports. The Intercity Express from Liverpool to Scarborough was just outside Manchester with 300 people on board. The goods train was on the same line, going in the same direction at a snail's pace. The express train ploughed into the back and there was an immediate explosion. Some of the passengers got out and fled up the embankment to a motorway, some with their clothes on fire, with a fireball following them. The driver of the express train died. A passenger died later, yet only nine of the 300 passengers were kept in hospital after treatment and only two were considered seriously hurt. A fail-safe that should have slowed the express train apparently failed. Eighteen people have now died in train crashes here this year, the worst year for British Rail for 20 years. In spite of it, a British Rail official says, our safety record is second to none. Geoffrey Sims, ABC News, London. today in one of Brisbane's worst suburban train accidents on record. The horrific head-on collision happened in the city's south. The Queensland government has set up a full-scale inquiry into the accident. The two electric trains, each comprising three carriages, collided head-on at a quarter to seven this morning near the Trinder Park station at Woodridge on Brisbane's south side. The driver of the northbound train was killed outright as terrified passengers, many of them screaming, were hurled about inside. Police, ambulance and other emergency services were on the scene within minutes assisting the injured. Most of the 60 passengers on the two trains were able to climb out on their own. Others had to be helped or carried on stretchers. Some had to be freed from the twisted wreckage by rescue workers using cutting equipment and axes. A fleet of 10 ambulances took the injured to the QE2 and Princess Alexandra hospitals. Of the 11 taken to the QE2, three were admitted one of them being the driver of the southbound train. X-rays revealed a number of fractures, but all are listed in a satisfactory condition. At the PA, the injuries were more serious. Seven of the ten passengers treated were admitted. The full extent of the damage to the trains was revealed when they were eventually pulled apart by cranes. A railway board of inquiry will begin on Monday to investigate why the two trains were on the same line with resulting tragic consequences. John Ross. National 9 News. Trying to determine whether human error led to today's crash south of Brisbane. Two people were killed and about 20 others injured when two passenger trains hit head-on. John Cameron reports. About 60 people were on board the two trains when the collision happened at 22 minutes to 7 this morning. The accident occurred just north of Trinder Park Station on the southern outskirts of Brisbane. The two electric trains were both derailed and the impact crushed both cabs right back into the passenger areas. It appears one driver jumped clear seconds before the impact, but the other driver was killed along with a passenger sitting immediately behind him. One of the passengers in a rear carriage was Gil Keane, who was unharmed but badly shocked. Four or five was in the carriage and it just went bang and I got hurled through. And there was another character there with us. And um, next one we couldn't get out the doors, so what I had to do, I'm shaking like anything now. I had to open the doors and the guard was all cut around the head. So we got him out first, and the driver jumped. I can't talk anymore anyway. Fair and uh, he jumped out. You know, and an ambulance coming, and that was it. When we went up to that second carriage, you smell all that flu. I mean, you see them blokes, and they're like, it's bad, real, real bad. Residents woken by the crash were the first on the scene, and among them was Rex Hartley, who helped many of the injured off the wreckage. One big mess, that's all I can tell you. Did you actually get on the train to yeah. help, help people? Yeah, seen the, down there where the bloke was, where he died there, and seen the other bloke chucked inside. One big mess. Also on the scene within an hour or so of the accident was the Transport Minister, Don Lane. We have to look at the technical aspects and the, uh, just how they were working and also whether there was any human error involved. And it's uh, too early to say that yet. A board of inquiry will be established uh, and we'll meet uh, on Monday. tonight when a tram ran off the tracks during peak hour. The tram ploughed across busy Doncaster Road into the front garden of a house. Ryan reports.
Tram driver Tom McManus had always campaigned against cars passing stationary trams. Ironically, earlier this month, he was struck and killed by a car as he left a tram after his shift. He was hit by a car that didn't stop, and his body finished about 30 metres opposite that drain over there. Everyone at the depot was devastated the way Tom died. Tram services on the East Burwood and Wattle Park lines will stop for three hours on Friday for a memorial service. The Tramways Union says cars illegally passing trams are endangering the lives of its members and passengers and are becoming an increasing problem which needs urgent government action. Last year, tramway employees reported 107 incidents where cars passed stationary trams. However, that figure is considered to be an extreme underestimation of the problem. The union wants penalties for passing cars increased and lights fitted to all trams to warn of deceleration and stopping. Industrial action, including stoppage, can't be ruled out. The mood of the workers around the industry is uh, extremely angry. Mark O'Brien. Hello again. Tramway drivers have threatened industrial action unless steps are taken to improve safety at tram stops. Tramway's employees today stopped work for three hours to attend the memorial service of a tram driver who was hit by a car two weeks ago. injured 15 people. The force of the crash in Mount Alexander Road was apparent when one of the trams was towed back to base. Twelve of the people injured in the early afternoon crash were passengers. Bystanders said it seemed the front tram had propped to miss a car and the following one had caused a shunt. Rescue workers took an hour to free all the injured and clear the wreckage. All the injured are now reported to be in a satisfactory condition.